one of the privileges of being up here uh, on stage, in front, whatever, however you want to think about it, to actually see the kids head out. I love our kids' church. I love the fact that we have such dedicated volunteers who are committed to, to loving and caring for the youngest people in our congregation. And um, I just pray that they would go out and develop good, strong friendships, but also that they would get that grounding and foundation and be strongly rooted and established in the Lord. It is a privilege that we have as a church to look after people of every generation. And so, yeah, my, part of my heart goes with them every time and not just because my daughter's in that group. Um, Heavenly Father, as you are our Father in heaven and you care for us and love us so much, so you care for these little ones. And if we were in any doubt of that, then Jesus showed it time and time again. And so, Lord, I do pray that even as we come to hear from your word, to receive from that, uh, that you would teach us through it, but also that we know you are present with our kids' church, with the leaders and with each of the kids, that your spirit is there and that you are ministering there as well. And so, Lord, I pray that you would stir up in their hearts a love for you, that we'll see them firmly established in faith and in their love of Christ, something that will stand them in good stead, keep them safe and secure in you through all the days of their life. Lord, may this be your will. In Jesus' name, amen. This Wednesday, just gone, I was here, actually, at Ellenbrook Christian College for uh, what they call the Wisdom Wednesday Devotions. So they have pastoral care groups at each year level and each Wednesday uh, they meet to hear uh, someone present on a, a particular devotion or, or topic. And this time I was with the year 11s and 12s and my topic was lifestyle and behaviour choices. So I went straight to First Peter. And that won't come as a surprise to anyone who knows me. Uh, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. But when it comes to my big theology, I most often go to John. And when it comes to how we live in the world as Christians, I most often go to First Peter. And as I was reading the text again, I was struck uh, I, by the wisdom of First Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong... They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That was good advice then, 2,000 years ago, and it's still good advice today. It is through these good lives that Christianity over the years has been so influential in Western society. From the very earliest days of the church, Christians were known for their selfless acts of charity, that they would care for the widows, the orphans, and, and others who were unable to provide for themselves. In times of sickness and plague, Christians won fame and renown because while everyone else was running for the hills, sometimes quite literally, they would flee the cities, Christians would stay behind to look after the sick. In the centuries since, Christians have often been at the forefront in healthcare, education and social welfare. Think of Wilberforce's campaign against slavery in England back in the late 1700s, the Red Cross, things like that. If you want a good Australian example, think of the Salvation Army. Now, I don't know, I, I haven't spoken to many people from the Salvos recently, but Maybe it's a bit different in some of the more contemporary Salvation Army churches these days, but for a lot of their official events and official ministries, they still wear their uniform. And they take that military rank thing quite seriously. And I look at that, and perhaps it's a little harsh, but I think that seems a bit old-fashioned. Maybe even a little bit ridiculous. But a salvo in uniform can walk into pretty much any pub in the country, rattle a can to ask for donations, and be taken seriously. More than that, you will see most of the punters reach for their wallet. 
because over a long period of time, the Salvos have shown that they are here to help. They serve the community and they do good. And that, in a nutshell, is my topic for this morning. We've been doing a series called uh, Last Words, First Priorities over the past couple of weeks. And we've been looking at the final instructions that Jesus left with his disciples as priorities for those who follow him. We've started with John's Gospel and Jesus' instructions to remain in me and to love one another as I have loved you. So that's what Jesus told his disciples. He left that with them as his last words of instruction. But with both of those, with remaining or abiding in Christ and with loving one another, there's a sense that they are inward-looking, that they're about us as a church. Remaining in, in Christ is logically enough for those who are in Christ. And when Jesus says to love one another, he's speaking his, to his disciples. The one another is, first and foremost, our brothers and sisters in the church. But I want to make the point, especially today, that they're not just inward-looking. And if that's all we see, we've made a mistake. If you go to John chapter 17, Jesus says that our unity, so our being in Christ together, is so that the world may believe that Jesus was sent by his Father. And in John 13, Jesus says, it is by our love for one another that, that everyone will know that we are his disciples. So our unity and our love for one another are not just benefits for the church. They're part of our witness for Jesus. They're actually part of disciple making, part of evangelism. And we'll get to that in more detail when we look at Acts and Matthew. But the point for now is to say that the way that we live with one another in church People see it. People see it, and it can either draw them towards Jesus or push them away. But Christian witness isn't just about what people see from a distance. It's not just about being super shiny and pretty over here, set apart from it all. It is about what we do in the world and how we serve in the world. And that brings us to John chapter 13 and Jesus' washing of his disciples' feet. I've got some of the verses up on the screen, but I just want to read that passage now, so let me pull it up. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. So there's the last words bit. Jesus knows that the time has come. His time with his disciples is now coming to an end. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evil meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And this bit's important, I want you to listen to this. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, 
nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So we see quite clearly Jesus knows his time, his ministry on earth is coming to an end. This is his last big opportunity to teach and instruct his disciples. And what's his priority? What does he do in that moment? He gets up from the table, he takes off his jacket, he goes and fetches some water and he washes his disciples' feet. And I think as Christians, and many of us would have heard that before, we like that story, we like hearing about those events, but I think we we don't often appreciate their significance. Peter and Paul both talk about imitating Jesus, about following the example he sets, but Jesus doesn't often speak that way. He teaches, he instructs, but it's very rare for him to say, you've seen what I've done, now it's your turn, go and do likewise. But here, he specifically draws attention to the example that he is setting for his disciples. This is important. This is really important. So perhaps I ought to have a basin up here and a towel. I thought about it. I, I actually thought it seriously thought about it. That I would get a seat and some water and towel and I would wash people's feet. And I don't actually have a problem with that. I would be very happy to do it. In the end, I decided against going through with that not because it's not a good thing to do, but because Jesus isn't just talking about washing feet. It's something that is still done in many churches. It is, in the right circumstances, a tremendously powerful symbolic act. But washing feet is just one of the many ways that we can serve each other, and that's the focus here. It is the fact that Jesus, teacher and Lord, serves his disciples. It is the fact of his service and the way in which he does it that is most important, not the particulars of what he is doing. And Jesus' service is sacrificial, humble, and it demonstrates his forgiveness. Let me take you through those quickly. Jesus' service is sacrificial in the sense that it is costly. It costs Jesus something. He has to give up something of his dignity and status, taking the very nature of a servant, to borrow Paul's words in Philippians. Jesus' service is humble. He puts his disciples' needs ahead of his own self-interest. And we see that in his exchange with Peter. Peter objects and Jesus basically says, no, you need this. You need this. And Jesus' service is forgiving. He washes the feet of Judas and Peter. That very evening, Judas is going to betray him, which Jesus knows. And Peter is going to deny him three times, and Jesus knows that too. And he serves both of them. So Jesus is giving an example of humble service, and through that, of loving one another. But I began by saying that it's our service, our action in the world that is an essential part of our witness. And here is Jesus, and he's serving his disciples, yes, but while they're gathered together in the upper room, away from the crowds, this is something just for his closest circle of friends. So isn't this not just another example of the one another, of something that we do in church for fellow believers? And I have to say, no. No, I don't believe it is. I am convinced that the way we serve one another in the church is linked closely to the way we serve others outside the church and in a bunch of different ways. In the first instance, it's a matter of perception, of optics, of how people see us. As I said before, people see what we're doing in churches and it can either draw people towards Jesus or push them away. If we talk about unity and love for one another, but what people see is disunity and apathy, or worse, infighting, 
then we are hypocrites and that will push people away. It is just ugly. If we serve one another in the church and don't serve one another outside the church, well, maybe that's not hypocritical in the same way, although I think that's arguable. But at best, it's favouritism. What does that say about our integrity? What does that say about our character as Christians? To put it slightly differently, we live in a society that values authenticity. The whole idea of authenticity is that our outward actions and behaviour match our inward character and values. When it comes to authenticity, looking good from the outside isn't enough. In fact, if that's all there is, people will be suspicious. It's far more important that we do good. Practical service matters. The early church knew it, the salvos know it. Jesus tells us as much. And here's the thing, it's not just about our integrity and how people see us. It's a question of Christ-likeness. As I said, this is part of our witness. We are representing Jesus in the world. People see Jesus through us, whoever we are as Christians. And Jesus' example, if we are to be like Christ, gives us no room for confining service to the church. Yes, Jesus prioritised spending time with his disciples, but beyond that, he healed the sick, he cast out unclean spirits, he spent time with and ate with sinners and tax collectors. As Jesus himself said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus came for those who needed help. And I think need is a far better guide to our service than whether or not someone is in the church. More than that, the Bible, Scripture itself, gives us no basis for confining our love and service to those within the church. We're dealing at the moment with Jesus' final instructions, and yes, in that context, Jesus does say love one another, and he gives us this example of service among his disciples. But let's not forget, Jesus also says, love your neighbour and even love your enemies. And as he says in Luke's Gospel, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If we want our love, if we want our character and our witness to be distinctly Christian, we must love and serve not only the one another here in the church, but also the others outside, everyone that we have the opportunity to serve. The whole testimony of Scripture is of a reaching out in love, a reaching out in love that begins with God, who is love. And God's love is a love that reaches out to the other, if I can just put it that way in general terms. We are loved by God and we are definitely not like Him. He is Creator, we are His creation. He is holy and perfect and yet while we were still God's enemies, God loved us. But if our love is to be like God's love, we can't just love others like us in the church. Love reaches out, and it reaches out practically as we serve. Personally, my sense of it is this. This command that we have to love one another, this example that we have to serve one another in the church, that is the starting point. It, we're to start here in loving and serving one another, but it can't stop there. This is, we start here because this is where it's supposed to be natural and easy. When it comes to loving and serving, church is supposed to be the tutorial, the easy mode. It's where we practice. So with, that when it comes uh, to loving and serving other people, people not like us, maybe even people who hate us, we can do it because we have that practice. 
Church is where we're supposed to be trained and equipped, where we're supposed to be shaped to be more like Christ, not just so that our churches are nice places to be, but so that we can do the work, so that we can be the people in the world that God calls us to be. And the writer of Hebrews draws some of these elements together when he writes, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So let me just see if I can quickly sum up where we've got to. In each of the Gospels, there comes a point when Jesus knows his time on earth is coming to an end. He knows the time when he can train and instruct his disciples is coming to an end. And you'd expect the instructions he gives in those circumstances to be important, to be priorities. And that's what we see. In John's Gospel, that is brought home by the very opening verse of chapter 13, that Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And he instructs his disciples Remain in Him, love one another, and follow His example of humble service. But what I particularly want you to see this morning is that although Jesus' instructions relate first to the church, they don't end there. They cannot stop there. Our unity, our love, our service doesn't stop with us, but extends out into the way that we relate to everyone around us. With that in mind, and in light of the manner of Jesus' service, his humility, his willingness to bear the cost, his willingness to forgive, what are some ways that we can serve like Jesus without needing to get a bucket of water up here? Well, part of Jesus' service is that it's sacrificial, it's costly. And one of the ways that we can bear a cost for others is by being generous and giving money. And I say that with a little bit of caution. I think we often get a bit self-conscious about giving money, about how that is serving and loving others. It's like giving people cash as a Christmas present. It might be exactly what that person wants, but it, it feels a little impersonal. But the fact is that a lot of people in our society are time poor and cash rich, relatively speaking. And Christians are no different. So we can serve others by our giving. And if we do that in a way that puts others' interests first and has a meaningful cost to us, then I think it counts. And I raise that because a couple of opportunities have come up recently through our our friends and partners at Baptist World Aid Australia. They've recently launched a, a crisis appeal for Afghanistan. Maybe you've heard about it. I'm certain you've at least heard about the situation in Afghanistan. You'd have to have been living under a rock to have missed this one. After 20 years of conflict, the Taliban retook the country in about a week. Hundreds of thousands of people have fled the country or are are, are internally displaced. Others are prevented from working and have no means of support. Anyone who doesn't meet the requirements of Sharia law, which includes Afghan Christians as well as other religious minorities, are in immediate danger. According to UN stats, nearly 11 million people need critical food and livelihood assistance and 3.5 million urgently need essential health services. That's a lot. So if you'd like to support one of our partners to make a difference, you can find the details of the Afghanistan crisis appeal. I've got the website up there. If you don't have, can't read that or need to take it down afterwards, come and ask me. I can show you where the website is. If you prefer something more targeted, then Baptist World Aid is also looking for more donors for their child sponsorship program. And as well as Baptist World Aid, as I said, we actually take up a collection for Compassion. Compassion Australia has a wonderful child sponsorship program. Um, And we might actually do something more about that on a different week, so I'm not going to go too far there, because I think child sponsorship is actually a um, a really positive way of making a difference in communities. I don't want to make it all about money, though. You can serve by your generosity in your giving, but I think if that's the only thing that you're doing, it's a bit of a problem. Because the serving is actually for our benefit as well. As we serve practically, it shapes us as Christians. 
So if you're paying someone else to do all your serving for you, if you're outsourcing it in that way, eventually that becomes unhealthy. So getting hands-on. And really here, the sky's the limit. There are so many opportunities all around us. There are lots and lots of opportunities to serve in the church. Like I said, that's where Jesus' example starts, with the one another. We have a great bunch of volunteers here. For the size of church we are, we have a lot of people who are involved, actively involved, in one or more of the different ministries or, or you know, just meeting with people. Truly dedicated people who have served in a number of different roles over a long period of time. But there are always opportunities. Always opportunities. You can help take the load of someone who's been, you know, doing something for a long time. You might have a new idea or something fresh that you can bring. We're always on the lookout for more people to help. But as, look, as keen as I am, as any, I'm as keen as any pastor to get our roster positions filled. I did say it's about service outside the church as well. And so I just want to highlight a few things because we also have people in this church who volunteer in all sorts of other places as well. Um, Swan Volunteer Resource Centre, Whiteman Park, Ellenbrook Rovers, Girl Guides. And that's just scratching the surface. I'm sure there's a bunch that I haven't mentioned as well. And those aren't church ministries. But our people who volunteer, volunteer as Christians. Their identity is in Christ. There's no way they could do it any differently. So as they go, as we all do into whatever we, wherever we find ourselves, we go as ambassadors for Christ. We go as representatives of Jesus and we bring something of the presence of Jesus with us everywhere we go, into those groups, into those volunteer opportunities, into our service. And as we serve, we have the opportunity in those places to demonstrate something of Jesus' love. And that is a tremendously valuable thing. And as well as those things that are actually outside the church, we actually have church or at least church-adjacent ministries that we're involved with that help serve people outside the church. The Parenting Grove is one of those. So we have the barbecue coming up next week. That is a great opportunity for us as a church to be more involved with the Parenting Grove, to start building more connections there. That's a tremendously successful program. Laura and her team really make a positive difference in the lives of the families who are involved. And you'll have a chance to talk with them next week to find out more about it. The other one that many of you will know about is um, Ellenbrook Meals, although I think the proper title is probably Midland Meals in Ellenbrook. I always get that wrong. Name aside, it is a tremendously important, and I keep saying that, way of serving the community of serving people, of showing Jesus' love for them. And I could happily talk about that, but as many of you know, our own Shirley has been heavily involved in setting that up and been involved with that ministry for a long time. So rather than hear from me, I would like her to come up again now. And she's going to talk about her service in that role. One John four verse nineteen says, "We love him because he first loved us." As a young child, I glimpsed the love of God for me. One John four verse twelve says, "No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us." Throughout my life journey in different churches and countries, to be in a church. Loved by brothers and sisters in Christ is such an amazing reassurance of the love of Christ that has been lavished on me. 
Romans 5, 6 to 8 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, can I keep that love to myself? I can't. It burns within me. This community I'm in needs to know the joy and hope that I have found in Christ alone. And just over a year ago, Midland Mills Ellenbrook started. Through this program, I have met many people in my community that I would never have had the opportunity to if it were not for my involvement with them at Ellenbrook Mills. Through the establishment of teams, I have come to know people by name, some widows, domestic violence victims, people from other churches like Seven-day Adventists, Anglicans, Catholics, Charismatics, Mormons, and even people who claim to be atheists. That's just my side of the table. On the other side, I've sat with domestic violence victims and their families, suicidal people, and elderly people living in their car, two families with children living in their cars because they have no home. Youth at risk on the street because it's safer in the street than in their homes. Widows. Widowers. Drug addicts. Alcoholics. Children without fathers. Children without mothers. A family of six more children whose father is in prison. Children who have been sexually abused. who have been violently abused and two young men living in our local bushes. Some of them are dirty, poor, rude and abusive but they all need something. They come wanting hot food, food for school lunches, someone that knows them by name and listens to their stories. Someone who cares about how they're travelling Sometimes they ask the hard questions like, where is God in my life? How would you answer that to someone whose wife is dying and whose children want nothing to do with him? This is our community. Someone who's lost all hope. Sometimes they ask for prayer. Sometimes I've been asked to pray over their home where terrible things have happened. Our community is hurting. It has no hope without Christ. But the love of Christ came to me first before I was even born and paid the price for my sin. and gave to me a family worldwide of brothers and sisters in Christ. And now that same love compels me to love these people also. Some of them are seemingly unlovable, but to Jesus he gave his life that they could be complete in him also. I don't get to choose who comes to the table, but I do get to choose to love them as Christ loved me. Ellenbrook Mills is an important part of my life at the moment, and it is shared by others in this church as well. And we all have a place of witness. Every day we collide with people who need the love of Jesus. Every day our lives are shorter. I don't walk where you walk. Only you can love those you collide with. Does the love of Christ, which is beyond our comprehension, compel you? As 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And my prayer is that your love for Christ compels you to share the love that he gave you first. Thank you. I really don't feel that I need to say any more after that. There's... 
did you hear? The love that we have received that burns within us. We don't get to choose who comes to the table. We don't get to choose all of the people that we will encounter, that we will come across and collide with during the day. But are we open to loving them, to serving them? So yes, I can come in here with a basin of water and I can set up a chair and I can get you to file across and I can wash your feet and pray with you and it would be a beautiful thing. But if we're not prepared to pick up our metaphorical basins and take them into the community and love and serve there, we've not gone the distance. We've not loved as Christ loved, the one who was willing to reach out to the least of these and who calls us to follow his example to do the same. Jesus' last words, his final instructions, they start with God, remain in me. They take root in the church, love one another. But love breaks out. It reaches out and it makes a difference. So whether it is Midland Mills, Ellenbrook, whether it's Parenting Grove, whether it's something else involved in church or parachurch or simply a community group that you're involved with, let us be intentional about that. Let us say that I will go as a follower of Christ into those places and I will serve there. I will love there as a witness to his love. Then I think we're starting to get it. Let me pray. I'm going to invite uh, the, the music team to come back up and lead us in one final song. Lord, help us to grasp your heart in this. Help us to lay hold of and to cling on to the love that you first showed us while we were still sinners, while we were still your enemies, you loved us. And if we're doing church right, I pray that people would experience something of that here. I really do. But let it not stop with us. Let it not stop with us. Not here but to, to reach out, to, to leak out, to explode out almost, because who could contain your love? Into the Ellenbrook community, into all the places that we go through our week, into our workplaces, into our sporting clubs and teams, into our schools, that we would go as ambassadors for Christ. And Lord, help us as a church be the embassy then, the resourcing centre, the training centre, the place that we practice these things. Lord, show us what that looks like and help us to walk in your ways. To the glory of your name and for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.